figured out. So I get the honor to speak this morning, and I'm very excited. I'm excited that you guys are here, and I get to share um, just what the Lord's been doing in my life with you this morning. Um, we're going to continue on with, with our series, Once for All, and we're going to be looking at Hebrews 4 today. Um, and I really like what Jeff was saying about practice. Um, the Lord has been convicting me lately about how I speak um, and about how I teach. And, and I'll bring you into this because I think it's good for us. But like a couple weeks ago, he convicted me and like, you say that you're a teacher, but you don't provide people time to respond or to reflect. All you're doing is speaking at them. And I was like, ooh, <laughs> whoops. Um, and I coach wrestling. I, I, I mean, if you guys have done any kind of sports, you know that they show you the move or they show you the technique or the concept, and then you get to go and practice it. So this morning, we are going to practice. Um, I won't be up here a very long time, and then we're going to end in some worship, okay? Um, and my goal this morning is, as we go through Hebrews 4, is to connect rest and worship. I can't explain the connection fully. I'm not going to pretend like I, I know this. Um, but I feel like the Lord wants us to connect the two, to see their connection. Okay? Um, and it'll feel a little bit um, like I'm pinballing through Hebrews 4, but it is intentional. Um, I feel like the Lord has some strategy for us this morning. So again... I just invite you to stay with me as we journey, okay? And the other thing that I'm going to ask so that we can actually practice at the end is as I go, if you um, feel the Holy Spirit convict you or um, you feel um, kind of like dreams inside of you stirred, okay, um, or you encounter like fear because of something I've said, so if you're if your heart starts to move or the fear in your stomach starts to move, take note, whether that's mental note or physical note. Take note of what that is so that you can act on that at the end. Does that sound good? Everybody good? Good. Okay. So, <clears throat> I'm going to share a little bit of a personal story with you. I'm explaining this because it's going to be different. Okay. I'm going to share my, a personal story with you here. And then I've got Hebrews 4 broken into four parts and those parts don't really flow together really well, but there's something in each of them that I feel is for us this morning. So we'll kind of go boom, 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 four little mini sermons, and then we'll end, okay? So again, stay with me. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to be talking about um, a promised rest for God's people, and my opening question for you this morning is, if, if God's promised rest is still available to us, how do we enter it? How do we enter it? So... The um, timing of this message and, and this opportunity for me to speak this morning is really interesting, and, and it's been quite convicting for me because um, I'm coming out of this season since about the middle of November um, until the middle of February, where, and this might be like my internal critic that's being pretty loud right now, but I, I failed to rest well. And I don't mean like sleep at night or sit on the couch with my feet up. Like, I failed to enter into God's ultimate Sabbath rest. I didn't do it. The other thing that's interesting during that time period is I struggled to enter into a place of worship. Okay? Um, most of the time when I, and Haley can attest to this, I get home from like a, a practice because I was, I was really busy. I was really busy. Um, I, I could, um, I either consumed or medicated, right? So consumed was the ream of Oreos, gluten-free, okay? So it's like <laughs> I have to feed something inside of me that is hurt and frustrated. I don't know what it is. Or it's just scrolling mindlessly through YouTube trying to get like the thoughts to stop long enough that my brain can be clear. It's not Sabbath rest. Okay? But I lived it for about three and a half months. Um, and see, during the summer when I was praying about this role that was offered to me, it was a head coaching role. Um, one day I was praying and, and, and I got really frustrated and kind of lashed out at the Lord and I told him, <laughs> like, like I can do this. Um, but I was like, <clears throat> I need an answer. Yes or no? Do I coach or not coach? Give me an answer right now. And uh, the Lord is so faithful and kind. He gave me an answer, but he's also very merciful, okay? So he gave me a different answer than what I was anticipating. Um, and here's what he said. He said, 
if you do it, I will bless it. And I didn't know how to measure that. I, I honestly didn't know what to do with that. I didn't, like, I wanted to assume that we were going to be state champs this year, right? I wanted to assume that we were going to win everything, and I was going to have this amazing eternal impact on the kids and on the coaches, and, and like, you know, I can, I can think, <laughs> I can make, I will bless it into, like, a lot of things, but I actually didn't know um, what that meant. And I want the Lord's blessing. So, like, I'm like, of course I'm going to coach, and I think we do as well right? I think if you're here this morning, like, you want the Lord's blessing in your life. Um, But here's what's happened. When I started the first couple of weeks, I got into this coaching role, and I saw these challenges and issues and systems that were in place that I felt like I couldn't fix and change. And it caused fear inside of me. I responded with fear. <clears throat> and fear caused me to assert my own energies to try, put my own efforts into it instead of trusting in God. So the spirit of fear caused me to work really hard and like be like, no, Lord, I've got this. Like, I have to do these things. I have to fix these things because this is, this is my role now. I said yes to this and I have to do it so that I can get blessed, <laughs> right? Um, and it caused me to, like, literally not trust. I did not trust. I didn't trust the school administration that I was working with. I, didn't, I just didn't trust anybody. Like, I was like, I have to do all this. I have to do all this. So that brings us to here to Hebrews 4. Um, and in these first two verses, the author is basically being like, you need to operate in faith. You need to operate in obedience unlike the disobedience that the Israelites operate with in the wilderness, okay? So, I'm going to break this up into four pieces. We're going to start with verse 1 and 2. I have multiple passages of Scripture this morning. Some of them you will be able to see up here, and some you won't, okay? So, the ones that you won't be able to see, let me read them over you. You receive them, okay? Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. So, I really resonate in the story that I just told with the Israelites in the wilderness, Because, like, the Lord gave me a promise. He gave them a promise. But um, when I got into the thick of it, and I started to look around and see what I would say are giants in the land, (laughs) I started to complain. I started to grumble. Um, I got really frustrated. I rebelled, okay? Um, And just in terms of, like, my ability to have faith in my obedience with the Lord, um, And the spirit of fear caused me to self-assert, okay? Okay, so here's the part for this first one. The spirit of fear removes us from the presence of God. And I think that rest is in his presence. So think of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Um, God comes, he's looking for them, they hear him, they run away and hide from him. They're afraid of him because they've sinned. A spirit of fear causes us to withdraw from the presence of God. It removes us from the presence of God. And it causes us to do things like build idols like golden calves, okay? Social media followings or a team with a really good win-loss record that's better than everybody else in your region, right? It causes us to do those things. That's what fear does. It removes us from the promise of rest because it removes us from God. We cannot rest outside of God. It's just consumption. It's just medication. Do we understand that? So, on the other side of that, the fear of the Lord allows us to respond to God in faith and obedience. So, the fear of the Lord is greater than a spirit of fear. I have an example of this in Hebrews eleven seven. 7. 
um, Noah, it's, it's the, writer, the author's writing about Noah, and just hear this for a second. Seven, verse 7 says this, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, holy fear, fear, fear of the Lord, did something that had never been done and never had been seen before. Like he responded to the Lord uh, in just such a beautiful way. In that verse right there, faith is said three times. If we're going to steward the promise of rest mentioned by the author in Hebrews, okay, we must let the fear of the Lord a holy fear, stir our faith because faith gives birth to obedience. Faith gives birth to obedience. So, looking at one and two, the promise of rest still stands for us. So let's enter it. Let's enter it. Okay? Let's be obedient and let's respond in the fear of the Lord, not a spirit of fear. Sound good? Awesome. Okay, we're going to skip to the next one now. In this section, I have verses 3 through 11, okay? Let me read through them, and then we'll talk briefly. Verse 3 says this. Now, we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from his works. And again in the passage above, he says... They shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again sent a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had, been give, had given them rest... God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. So, in this section here, Um, the writer in Hebrews mentions two other passages of scripture. I want to touch on both of them. Sound good? The first is Psalm 95. The second is uh, Genesis 2, 2. Um, Psalm 95 is a hymn. It's a call to worship. So in speaking about rest, the author references a psalm that is a hymn, that is a call to worship. I'm going to read it. You can just receive. Let, let this go over you, okay? Verses 1 and 2 are the call to worship. Here's what they say. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Verses 3, 4, and 5 are explanation of God's greatness. Here they are. For the Lord is the great God the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Six is a call to worship with reverence. Hear this one, verse six. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. The first part of seven is is. A description of our identity as God's people. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. And then the second part of seven here is a call to obey, and what follows it are the implications of disobedience. Here they are. Today, if only you would hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as you did in Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, Though they had seen what I did, for 40 years I was angry with that generation. 
I said, here it is, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Psalm 95 teaches us about God's promised rest by calling us to worship. It's a call to worship, a call to worship him in reverence um, and obey his voice. Hmm. The second part, um, the second scripture that he references here, Genesis 2, this one's interesting for me and the Lord has really been um, dealing with my heart in this one. So in Genesis 2, 2, what we see is um, the Lord resting from his creation. Okay, so Genesis 1, the Lord does, he, he, he creates on day 1, he says it's good. Day 2, day 3, day 4, day 5, he says it's good. Day 6, he creates and he says that it is very good. Yep. Day 7, he rests from his work. Okay, it says that he rested on day 7. Meaning, and this is what's been convicting for me, that the rest that we need to enter is God's rest and not our own. Sometimes when I, when I think about rest, it's like, oh, what do I need to do that serves me? Here's why it's not our own. The rest that we need to enter is God's rest, not our own. Here's why it's not our own. In Genesis 2, 3, it says this, then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. He made it holy. Holy is that word in the Bible, um, in scripture, that means set apart. When something in the Bible is, is holy, it is set apart for like a special purpose. And in, and in most cases, I would say all, that special purpose is for God, for worship. So he rested on the seventh day. He blessed it and he called it holy. He said it's holy. It is set apart for a special purpose. So worship him. Let rest and worship be connected. It's, it's not yours. Sabbath rest that is being offered to you and you are being invited into is not yours. It's his. It's for him. It's holy. It's set apart. Mm. And so, Sabbath rest should enhance our relationship with God, okay? Because when we participate in Sabbath rest, we are participating in something that has been set aside for him. It is worship. It is his. It belongs to him. Are we good with that? Good. Okay. Moving on. Verses 12 and 13. <clears throat> For the word of the Lord is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This section is like the underlying theme for what we're doing this morning. I am trying to present God's word, written and spoken, so that it ministers and convicts you, so that you then respond in an act of worship and enter his rest. <clears throat> Here's what I'd like you to take away from these verses. Very simple. We must obey God's word. Um, obedience to his word, both his written word and his spoken word, bring conviction to our inner beings, okay? Um, and they make it possible to even enter his rest. Um, I, in my study, I came across this quote in one of my um, commentaries, and I want to read it to you this morning. Um, the author is writing about verses 12 and 13 here, okay? Um, this is very convicting, so let me just read this over you. Picture this in your mind. When those who are playing church, stranded between Egypt and Canaan, truly enter into his presence and are confronted with his holiness, they will have their flippant, shallow, 
churchianity stripped away. And like Isaiah in the shadow of King Uzziah's death in Isaiah 6, they will find themselves naked before his striking presence, crying out that they are indeed ruined and dirty. Listen, we have to have obedience to God's word, both his written and his spoken word. We have to learn to steward his spoken word. We have to learn to hear his spoken word. It searches our innermost beings. Like, we need God's word to enter his rest. And I'm not saying today that if you go home and dust off your Bible and crack it open and start reading, that you're going to encounter his rest. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to encounter his word in such a way that we allow his word to read us, to search us, and not just us reading it and studying it and moving on with our lives. We have to engage with his word in such a way where it enters us and it's like a freaking scalpel and it cuts away junk that shouldn't be there, garbage that's in the way, things that are inhibiting us and keeping us away from his presence. We need to encounter his word in such a way where it does the work. It searches, it reads, not us. We good? Awesome. Last section here. Verses 14, 15, and 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, the connection that I've been trying to make this morning, rest and worship. I think to enter God's rest is to enter into a place of worship and vice versa. I think to worship and enter into a place of, of like being in his presence is to encounter his rest, his ultimate Sabbath rest. And, um, When I read in this section that Jesus is our great high priest that that makes it possible to approach God's throne of grace with boldness and with confidence, I cannot help but think what is happening before the throne of God right now. And in Revelation 4, 6 through 11, this is what John says, okay? John saw the throne of God and, and, and around it were these four living creatures who, let this just go over you, receive this. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give honor, glory, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne. And they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Mm. If this is what it's like in the presence of God, then the promise of Sabbath rest should compel us to worship. The promise of Sabbath rest should literally compel us to worship if it causes you to step back causes fear causes you to be like wow i'll do it on my own time whenever i I don't think it's sabbath rest (laughs) i just don't it's his it's in his presence Hmm. so a final thought here regarding my earlier story um in the last few weeks uh, i've been trying to go through this process of rest because i really exerted myself the months before Um, and the Lord has literally been convicting me because I can go for a walk or I can crack a book open. Um, We could even get away for a weekend. But if I do not worship during those processes, it's just an activity. It's just another thing where I am exerting my own effort, my own pride, my own ego, whatever it is. It's just disguised as rest. 
So I feel like a lot of us in the room uh, need to encounter Sabbath rest today. I think that you're pretty tired. I think that I'm pretty tired. And I think we've been working pretty hard at resting. And uh, we need to quit working hard to rest and just worship God and enter his presence. Um, so we're going to practice. Uh, we're going to practice. In verse 16 it says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Um, if our worship team could come on up now. Here's what, here's what we're going to do. Our worship team is going to come up. They're going to do a few more songs. I don't know what that means, but I'm okay with that. Um, we're not going to worship in the sense that we, like, we stand and read the words off the screen. Okay? Um, whatever you took note of during the sermon, like whatever scripture that spoke to you or whatever word that was spoken that convicted your heart um, or caused fear, like that's what you're going to act on right now. Okay? So if you need to sit as we worship and you need to just be with the Lord, then sit. If you need to stand up uh, and move into the aisle and get on your face, then stand up, move into the aisle and get on your face. If you need to come to the front to um, show that you're willing to, to approach the throne of God with boldness, do it. And I'm not saying that this is the throne of God, but what I'm saying is if we're going to rest body, soul, spirit, then we have to worship body, soul, spirit. So do something, okay? I have a few examples as I was sitting with the Lord um, that I will read to you now. If, if any of them speak to you or minister to you, feel free to do them. Um, as they worship, if you feel like you need to confess for disobedience, do it. If you feel like you need to confess for lack of faith, do it. Um, if you feel like you need to ask Jesus to remove a spirit of fear and exchange it for a fear of the Lord, do it. If you need to come before God with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song, extol means to praise enthusiastically. Psalm 95. If you need to do that this morning, do it. If you need to bow down and worship and kneel before the Lord your maker, Psalm 95, do it. If you need to respond in faith to his word, whether it's um, a scripture that you've been memorizing, reading, or whether it's a, a prophetic word that you've been weighing and stewarding for some time, respond to that. Whatever it's been convicting you to do, do it. <laughs> 